Okay, my clock shows six o'clock, uh, so I will call this to order. Um, for anyone here who might uh, not know, my name is Jonas. I'm a board member from Worcester. Uh, I'm the clerk of the board, and I'll be chairing uh, the meeting tonight uh, in floor and Kari's absence. Um, so the first thing that I, that uh, we need to start with is to table the executive session uh, without floor uh, and Kari here. Uh, we felt it was best to uh, to move recording this to the next in progress. So unless any, uh, anyone has uh, questions or objections uh, to that, uh, I think we can move right forward. Okay. Okay. Um, so so Jonas, yes. this is Diane. I have a question. So Hi, are, are we within legal timelines if we postpone it? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I lost my Zoom window for a second. Uh, so I will we'll start with the welcome of guests. Um, good to see Dave again. Um, Center for an Agricultural Economy. Um, can I ask who that is? Can we put a name uh, to that login? Sorry, Jonas, this is Daniel. I just have to change for my work. Oh, hi, Dan. ID. Got it. And hello, Alice. Um, public comments, any comments, any public comments? If you want to, if anyone wants to speak up, please just unmute yourself and speak or use the, uh, the raise hand function. Seeing no public comments, uh, we'll move to agenda revisions. Uh, we've just revised the agenda to table the executive session. Any other agenda revisions uh, from the board? No. Nope. Seeing none, we will move on to reports. Uh, and I will very happy to turn this over to Megan Roy, the new superintendent. Yeah. Well, welcome everyone. Um, happy to be at, for my first official board meeting, although I did see um, a number of you at the retreat and at some committee meetings since then. Um, I'll start with just uh, informally um, welcoming everyone back. We welcomed teachers and staff back today to their local buildings. Uh, today was the first day of in-service. Um, we have uh, tomorrow is convocation in the auditorium at U32. Although it's no obligation, there's an open invitation to board members to join us for the opening remarks. If any of you are interested and able, they start at 8.30 in the auditorium, breakfast is at 8. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a, August is a busy time. We're still finalizing, uh, bringing on all of our staff and teachers, as many as we can. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and I, I just wanted to uh, add that some of the updates that we'll do probably in next month is a little bit more detail around what our professional development looked like during pre-service, how that sort of fits in some of the um, guiding categories that the leadership team has, um, that the board has. So um, we'll, have, we'll have more to share after that. Um, the other piece that I wanted to share, I think you've all had a chance to read in a couple different formats now, um, the COVID-19 guidance to start the school year. You've probably also, um, you know, read about, read about it in the news. Um, the Agency of Education and the Department of Health have issued um, a, a indication of what the guidance would be. Um, and, you know, I'll highlight it a little bit and then pause for questions. Um, I think uh, most people are familiar at this point with the guidance that is um, very much rooted in um, monitor symptoms, individuals monitoring symptoms, staying home when they're sick, um, testing when symptoms present themselves, isolating uh, it for positive cases. Um, we have some procedures in place uh, for what happens when students or staff show symptoms at school. Um, and, uh, and that's really the bulk of our guidance and the messaging from the Agency of Education and the Department of Health came out um, 
uh, we didn't think it would come out in time, but it did come out um, right about when we wanted to share the information with our um, community. So, you know, I think everyone is used to lots of guidance that needs to be digested and then shared back out. Um, so we're in a little bit of a different place starting the school year. I think that's um, exciting and for some will be anxiety producing. So uh, I'll, I'll pause uh, and see if there are any questions about the guidance. I'll ask a question. Um, sure. uh, Megan, the, the COVID MOU uh, that was signed with the unions last year, that's expired. Uh, do you anticipate that there will be further discussion about a, a successor to that MOU? It's a good question. Um, I have not received the question. I haven't been asked the question um, yet. We do. We will start our labor management committee um, structure starting in September. Um, that would be one opportunity for the question to be raised. Um, you know, I think given the 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 given the current context and the the nature of the Department of Health, I um, I don't know that I anticipate it, but that's that's part of what our labor management committee conversations are for is to be able to surface those those issues if they come up. Good question. And I didn't see anything in there about um, limiting at, like community access to schools. Um, am I correct in that that's no longer a thing that that community members are welcome to be in schools now? That's a great question. There are no longer limitations on um, outside people in our buildings, um, not not for COVID reasons. So so we're sort of back to, um, you know, I think Jonas and I were talking about kindergarten day, you know, parent night. So, so yes, I think folks are really excited to be able to welcome families back into our building for some for the first time ever. Any other questions for Megan uh, about the COVID update? Chris? Yeah, and, Jonas, um, and Megan, is Maria still um, in her position as the COVID coordinator? Um, so currently, uh, she is not in a formal position as COVID coordinator. Uh, she is the full-time nurse at Calis. Um, where we are, in, she did uh, sit down with me to go through this guidance. I, um, I used, <laughs> used her expertise to make sure that we checked that. Um, one of the things that we will do next year, um, most districts, um, in fact, all the districts that I've consulted with um, also have not continued their COVID coordinator position. We would like to still preserve the ability to connect with our school health experts in our system when and if things come down or questions come up. Um, so we, our contract already has a uh, teacher leadership structure and um, that goes for, you know, literacy teacher leaders, math teacher leaders, you name the subject. Our intention is to create a school nurse teacher leader position. Um, it is not an FTE, it's a, it's a stipended position, but it would give us the structure, at least in this year, to be able to benefit from COVID consultation from our, from our nurses. So we're likely to post that um, soon. Thank you. Any further discussion, questions for Megan? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to uh, section five, board operations, uh, starting with the discussion of the board retreat earlier this month. Um, obviously, if you were there, you know that I was not there. Um, unfortunately, I hope it was really good and I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Uh, I will turn it over to Megan uh, to, to, start, to start this conversation. Sure. So I think our, um, I'll, I'll start by saying, um, I think our intention was to have a little bit of a conversation today in the spirit of debriefing, what were some things that stood out for individuals. Um, and so in a second, I will go around and just, um, you know, give each person who was there the chance to, to share what they heard. 
Um, and then, then talk a little bit, um, I, we left knowing that that was part of, part of the conversation and there's probably a lot more conversation to be had. I think our hope was to use one of our meetings in September, probably the second one, um, to have, uh, to be structured in a little bit of a retreat part two format, um, partially because a number of you weren't there. So when we get down to things like affirming our board goals, um, talking about our work plan, um, we would like to do that in September. Um, so we'll have a little bit of a discussion about that. Um, and then uh, also would like to share with the board some thinking around our September 7th meeting. So that's what we'll do. We don't have to, we don't have to recreate the retreat, but kind of talk about highlights. Um, I don't know if someone who was there is, feels particularly strongly that they want to start. I don't yeah, know ahead. that I don't know that I'm particularly strongly, but um, <laughs> I appreciated the presentation um, by Pietro Lynn. It was very informative, and he responded to our questions. And I just feel like, as a board member, it was very helpful for me to hear his information as far as legal and board. And uh, that was it was a very good presentation. Thanks, Lindy. Ursula. I'll jump in. I agree with Lindy that first presentation by Pietro was really, really good. I thought it was easily digestible, even though there was a lot of very good legal information in there, but he presented it in a way that was helpful and easy to digest for us. And the second part um, with Phil Gore, like I just kind of being a back and forth chatting type of thing. I thought it was very good, the focus being on achievement in our schools and how we can do better. I just thought it was very helpful. And we kind of heard some of the same things that we've been talking about um, here, you know, reviewing policies, reviewing um, procedures and coming up with how we're gonna do that. Thanks, Ursula. Do you want to go next? Um, so um, I, I also enjoyed Pietro's and uh, Phil's presentations and uh, particularly took away from Pietro um, the uh, concept of um, whether you, you could, but whether you should. So it's kind of, you may have this, the board may have these um, um, authorities to do things, but the question is whether we should be doing them. And it just is, is a very, I think a good guiding point to our um, decision making discussion and interactions with our um, our administrators and our our staff members. Um, I would like you know Phil was uh, just I, I think enjoyable to have uh, and you know we we he talked a little bit about the book improving school board effectiveness uh, and I think we would do well just to um, you know assign, I guess it would be an assignment really, um, is just different pieces of it and have a uh, board discussion on, on the book itself. Um, Phil seemed pretty enthusiastic about it and realistic about it in terms of, you know, how much, you know, what a hard slog some of it is. Um, but overall, I think he had, had a good insight into it, uh, particularly since his name is on the front cover. I think he has a pretty good insight into it. Um, but overall, I think it was a good retreat, uh, and it was good discussion. Uh, it's, I, I thought it had a, a format that a treat, retreat should have in which it's not lecture, it's discussion, and very informative that way. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Daniel? I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, and I think I would add only that... Um, a piece that I missed, uh, which I think it was alluded to in the agenda or the introduction, was a little bit more of an um, Q and A around uh, Vermont's open meeting law. And as a new member, felt like that was missing. I think that distinction Chris mentioned about 
could versus should of what we should do, I think was a really great conversation. I think in some ways it overshadowed, you know, really the detail about what we can do in terms of initiating communication, um, in terms of initiating conversations and policy conversations, uh, both among ourselves or uh, with with the community. And so I, yeah, I would welcome another opportunity with Pietro to go over that, or if there's some other format, um, that'd be welcome too. And I think he mentioned sharing his PowerPoint, which um, I'm not sure if he's done. Yeah, thank you for that, Daniel. I don't think he has yet. So um, that's a good prompt. I will ask him to do that and get it out to folks. Others that were there. I see no more raised hands. Perfect. Thank you. So what I would um, what I would add to the reflection, I, I agree with what folks said. I really appreciated the conversation as a new superintendent. First of all, just appreciate the opportunity to sit down and get to know people, get a sense of of you know, and I've had individual conversations with folks. So uh, this was a nice opportunity for a back and forth. Uh, it, and it's no surprise that this happened, but I, there's a lot of themes. There's a lot of commonality in what we're talking about in general, both individually and at the retreat. Um, and they fall nicely into the goal areas that this board um, was operating off of last year, which is academic outcomes for students, communicate, community engagement, and long-term planning. Um, and I, at least from my observation, much of what we talked about continues to fit into those areas. And then we had good discussion about um, specific action steps that, that the board um, could focus on for, for the coming year. So, um, I think what we would like to do at, at, we'll call it retreat part two, although our intention is not to have an additional meeting, it is to, to fit it into an existing meeting um, and have our leadership team be part of that conversation. Um, but it would be to affirm that those are the three goal areas, talk a little bit more specifically about um, what are the pieces we know we want to focus on within each area so that we can have a little bit of a more specific grain size. Um, and that'll give us the information we need to, to affirm a work plan that kind of tells us what we'll focus on. So um, that is the intention uh, and, and probably would talk with the steering committee a little bit more about what, that, what the agenda for that second retreat would look like if that feels comfortable to the board. Right. All right. Any any other comments? Any other uh, atmospherics from the retreat? <laughs> I'll take anything. Well, can I comment as someone who wasn't at the retreat? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I I was disappointed to not um, be able to participate as a new board member, and um, you know, feel like it would be great if we could get some sort of recap or maybe you did I don't know maybe I missed it in my email but maybe you guys did send some sort of reading list or something that I don't know I feel like I feel a little left out so it'd be good to, <laughs> to get caught up thank you for that Michaela and, um we actually you're right we did not send um a, a summary and um Phil we will reach out so this is related to the um book that Chris uh, referenced. Um, there are pieces of that book that ground good conversation that I think matches some of the things that are already in our work plan. And I think what we would firm up at this next conversation is when those would happen. Um, and to your point of like, can we get a recap? Um, the the uh, we would in looking we would be looking to invite Phil to that meeting on the 21st so to the second part and he would 
probably ask, so there may be a homework assignment built in here, but um, we'll confirm that um, and, and email it out, um, would be to read the first chapter of the book because the first chapter of the book is really about um, how boards can function in a way that helps foster student growth, which is kind of the critical part. And then what does good governance look like to get us to that point? And it's a nice overview chapter. So I think the, I think that may give enough, of, yet it might not replace having been there, but I think it'll give enough of a um, framework for how it started. And then that would ground that first meeting. So we can um, send that more specifically. And this is also reminding me, we do have copies of the book for anyone who wasn't there. Um, so you can reach out, they're here at central office, um, but if there's another way that we can get it to you, um, you can just reach out and we'll figure out how to make sure you have that. Thanks. Yeah, that's great. I'll stop by and get a book. Okay, moving on. Uh, 5.2, uh, appoint superintendent as V, uh, as Visbit proxy. Uh, so we need to uh, appoint someone as our proxy to the Visbit meeting uh, in October. I think traditionally this has been the superintendent and uh, uh, Megan is looking forward to doing it this year. So could I get a motion uh, to that effect? So I move that we appoint Megan Roy, our superintendent, as our proxy to the visit Visbit meeting um this year second Ellen. all those in favor aye aye, aye. 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 all those aye. opposed uh that motion has carried and 5.3 uh we need to appoint a voting member to the vsba conference uh, last year, Ursula, I think uh, you were our representative there. Uh, do you want to do it again this year? I can do that. Okay. And does anyone else it have did. any interest? Dan, can I get a motion? I move that we appoint Ursula Stan Stanley as our um, voting member for the VSBA annual meeting this year. Second. I'll second it. Oh, okay. <laughs> and you know, all those in favor of appointing Ursula uh, as the, our voting member to the VSBA conference, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. That motion also carries. Moving on, if I can find my place, to 5.4. Uh, discussion of how we are going to hold future board meetings. If we're going to uh, remain remote, uh, should we be in person? Uh, should we have a hybrid um, setup? Um, and if we do it in person, where should the location be? Who wants to start this one off? I'm happy to start. Um, it's been two years and um, at the retreat, you know, I, I said to Daniel, God, Daniel, you look different. Did you cut your hair? Did you do that? And he goes, uh, no, I don't think I did any of those things. And it turns out that I had never seen Daniel in person before. And it really, I think that's what it was. He just looked so different than in person than I had than watching him on Zoom. So I would urge that we um, hold our meetings in person. Uh, it, it does make a difference. There's a, a different... Uh, communication, I think, when we're all together. Um, and so I would urge that we start meeting in person and that we um, alternate meetings so that we go to each of the uh, elementary schools in the district, uh, much the way we did, uh, I think, probably three years ago now, um, alternating sites. So we do one at U32, one at one of the outlying, uh, at one of the elementary schools, and um, and also have a, a uh, a Zoom option for those who want to appear by Zoom um, because we do get greater participation uh, from the public when we're on, on Zoom, when we have the Zoom option rather than just in person. So um, that would be my, my hope for our upcoming uh, year. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm not sure of the order of those three hands that are up, but I'll just start from the top of the order that I see, Ursula. 
I'm okay with in-person meetings. I think that it would be important to continue to offer a hybrid model like we've done to allow accessibility for those who might not be able to make it in person. It, it just provides greater access for people. We have to consider our resources if we're gonna do hybrid models though. My understanding is, is that if we go to the elementary schools, we will not have the support to be able to have a hybrid model meeting at the elementary schools. So it would be in-person only, which would mean we're limiting access to people to attend. Thanks, Ursula. Diane? McKaylin. McKaylin. Thanks. Um, I, I feel pretty strongly that we should go back to in-person, um, but also have the Zoom option, I think there's an equity issue on both sides. As someone who has unreliable Wi-Fi at my house, the Zoom only option is super hard sometimes. Um, and so I think we should respect that not everyone in the district has reliable internet. Um, but also, as Ursula said, you know, it's important, I think, for people who can't make it in person because childcare issues or whatever, work schedules, um, be able to uh, zoom in if they want to. So ideally a hybrid option, but um, but if I had to pick, I'd pick in person. And um, I think also ideally we could rotate sites as Chris was saying, but if it's a technology issue, then I'd say just have it at U32 for that reason. Thanks, Michaela and Diane. So we had this uh, discussion, I know that we'll keep revisiting it, but one of the things we had said is that the first meeting of the month as part of the community meeting, that we would definitely be in person and that we would rotate. It would be a hybrid, but that we would rotate. I think we need to rotate as a merged board. Uh, we're not as necessarily as familiar with all of the schools. And so, you know, just to be in one of our buildings to me limits our ability to connect it's not the only time we can connect, but to me, it's important to have that travel. Um, and I think we just work with how do we make sure the technology supports are in place. I mean, those are my understanding. There are Washington Central technology supports. It's not U32 technology. So, I mean, I think there are ways around that. Um, and I'm absolutely fine with, with being in person. Um, I just know we had kind of talked about being in person the first meeting as a priority and then the second meeting being hybrid. If we could keep in mind, um, not hybrid, but virtual, um, if we could keep in mind that if the weather forecast is kind of iffy, um, that to me it would be uh, e um, more peace of mind if I knew I would be at home and wouldn't have to be driving between nine and 10 in a snowstorm or something, so. Thanks, Diane, Lindy. Um, when Chris was talking about the first and third, whatever they are, uh, I agree with him the way we used to do it, where one a month was in the elementary schools. And I think since we've had um, all of the remote learning and everything, the elementary schools could host, but Megan could look into that and figure out how the technology department, it may not be as um, easy, but if we had somebody there to monitor a screen with the people outside, um, I think we could make that work. And I think we should be in person for both per month, but either the first or third, the one that's not community, would be at U32 each month. And then the one we're calling community would be across the schools mm -hmm. and work it on the agenda more clearly so that whatever is the main thing, like today's it looked like the main thing was at U32, the way the headline was done yes. versus Zoom. And then there is uh, in-person at the cafeteria. So just so that the agendas are clear for people. Thanks, Lindy. Daniel. Um, yeah, I agree with folks who are suggesting uh, we go back to in-person with a remote option. I think that it does seem that that's 
that duo option is more important for the business meeting than it is for those first meetings of the month, those fora. Um, I also just wanted to invite administrators to, I, I just, I, my time on the board comes after any of these previous visits to schools we've made. I don't know if there are unintended consequences of us showing up and um, them having to make space for us in the school after hours and you know what that's all about. So if, if people have observations to make, I'd be open to hearing those. Thanks, Daniel. Maggie. Um, I uh, just reflecting that it wasn't that long ago, Daniel, that we all had our own school boards in those schools. So the merger, you know, but it wasn't it wasn't too long ago that every school was hosting a school board um, in the library. And I, I think um, the U32 location might be beneficial to to revisit whether a space with rugs like the library, someplace that's acoustically more conducive for um, audio, um, especially with the numbers, it, it seems like that could easily accommodate us and whomever would be choosing to show up unless it's an incredibly contentious issue. Um, but I also would love to, to participate in, with in person. I have also been on the board only since we've been remote. Um, and I think that, that there's a lot of value to that. Um, although I also agree that, you know, as someone with limited um, internet at home, I can participate via audio only and that that is something most people do have some kind of phone service at home so zoom can also be done that way it doesn't have to be video which is a nice option um i also was unclear about where our me meeting was tonight um through reading um what i could find both on um uh the calendar the tandem calendar in addition to our individual invitations Thanks, Maggie. Any other thoughts, any other comments? Just real quick, I, I enjoy the ability to be remote because of my schedule, but tonight's a perfect example where my internet is so horrible that I've literally heard maybe a quarter of what's been said. So I'm, I'm all in favor of the hybrid meeting that um, people can choose. Thanks, Dennis. Any other thoughts? Jonas? Yeah. Um, I have a, a question for Ursula. Um, Ursula, um, what have you heard about the um, just the infrastructure or the ability to have a, um, I guess, a remote connection, connection at any of the elementary schools? Or, or what was the, um, con the concern? I believe it was a discussion I was having with Megan at one point when we were talking about meetings. It was either at a steering committee meeting or another time. Um, I don't know if Megan's willing to discuss it more. Yeah, I, I was going to say I can jump in. Um, I, I too have heard anecdotally that it's just harder to have a really clean hybrid setup that actually works well so that the people on the screen can actually hear. Um, I think what would make sense is for me to go back and gather that information. What would it look like in each building? Is there equipment that we need that we don't have that we would need to purchase? Or do we have what we need? Um, you know, what are the logistics involved? And that way, the hybrid part, um, we can have more concrete information. I think um, you always lose a little when some people are in person and some people are virtual. Technology can make it better. Um, but I think that's what the board will want to weigh is the importance of rotating location and imperfect hybrid um, outweigh uh, a better setup in one building. And I don't know the answer to that question. So I think it, I think it would be important to get some more concrete information back to you all. Um, and just, you know, for the immediate future, um, one of the things that I actually meant to include in the uh, retreat debrief, but, but forgot, um, I, I would like to propose that our September 7th meeting, which is a community forum, so our September 7th community forum um, 
actually be used for, um, this would be an in-person event, um, a, a, a meet the superintendent and meet the school board um, evening. Uh, it wouldn't be any longer than the normal community forum. Um, and I don't pretend that it is um, checking all of our boxes around community engagement, but I've had lots of individual conversations with folks. Um, I am excited that school is starting and coming back, so I'll be able to get into buildings, but I haven't really had an opportunity to um, invite the public in. Um, this is also connected, sorry for a little bit of a bird walk, but this is also connected to um, what's in our monitoring plan from last year is to do a data review in September, which we would like to do, but September 7th is very quick. Um, and if we could do that the 21st as part of our um, retreat session, and I think the two things actually dovetail nicely. Um, so the reason I bring up the 7th is um, I would still be able to bring back some information at that point about our hybrid ability the seventh would be in person. There would be a community um, uh, uh, meet the superintendent and meet all of you, quite frankly. I think that is nice for the community. Then we would have a board meeting um, at the location we're at afterwards, probably a shorter business meeting. And then the 21st would be a retreat. So it would give us some time to get more information about what hybrid would look like. So I, I merged two conversations with that comment but would love the board's thoughts on the 7th. Anybody have thoughts about that uh, first Wednesday in September? First one. I think the idea of a meet the superintendent, meet the board is a good idea. I've run into several people in the community who I think still don't understand how we work as a board that we are one board for all of the schools and maybe, and I know COVID's had a lot, like just separating community from our school communities. Um, I don't know, I meet the, meet the group would be maybe helpful towards that end. Peggy. I'm just wondering if we might also prioritize open houses at all of the schools as another opportunity for us to be forward facing to the community. Um, and I haven't looked at tandem to see when all of them are, but I know I am just thinking that September is a very busy, um, very busy month for families, school families in particular. So we might need, it might be helpful to have a, a couple of opportunities. So it's it sounds um, you know, it sounds like you know doing the seventh, having that community forum, and you know publicizing it as a meet the board, meet the superintendent event, you know with a brief business meeting afterward. Um, I don't hear any objections to that. I see all nodding heads. I think that makes sense. Um, and then for the twenty first, if we were going to do that retreat style, obviously that would be in person. Um, do we have a Megan? Do you have a sense of where you'd want that to take place? My default would be U32 in absence of a more thoughtful decision about, you know, rotation um, and also just size wise, if the whole leadership team is there, that um, it's probably the best equipped space wise. So I, I think a good way forward is to is to, you know, unless there are objections to that, let's let's move forward with that. But I, you know, I don't want to be making any decisions tonight about future meetings without floor and without Kari, right? Without our chair and our vice chair. But I think you're for, to have that that clarity for September. And then the first meeting in October would also be an in-person uh, forum, probably at U32, but we can discuss that on the 21st. I think that that makes, I think that makes sense. Uh, I also don't hear anyone, um, you know, being really fundamentally opposed to going back to meetings in person. Um, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not wild about that idea. Um, you'll see me in a mask. Um, I also feel like I've been able to participate as a full member of the board remotely. Um, and I, you know, but I also understand that, uh, that, that people don't And it, but it does seem like there is consensus that um, having our meetings primarily in person is the way the board wants to go. 
um, you know, where, what that location is and whether we can rotate among the elementary schools, I think remains to be seen and we'll gather that data uh, and we'll hear that from, from Megan uh, next time. Um, but, uh, you know, at least, uh, you know, I'm coming away from this meeting that that's, that's the direction we're, we're going. So I think if, if anyone feels real, you know, if anyone is, you know, you know, wants to revisit that, you know, I think we should talk about that, you know, perhaps next time during the business meeting, um, to make sure that we're all on, on board with that going forward. But it does seem that that's the way the board wants to go. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. Any other discussion about this before we move on to uh, staff appreciation? Diane, I'm going to look at you to talk about staff appreciation. Yeah, given that it's a new school year, um, I think what makes the most sense is to uh, get a again a potentially a subcommittee together. I'll talk with Floor about setting that up so that we can figure out um, a schedule of again of being part of staff meetings quarterly, and then also uh, you know what what other activities we might want to do just to acknowledge throughout the year. So currently, it like Megan said, today was a kickoff day in the in the buildings. Um, so if people want to send a, a nice welcome back kind of email to staff, I think that'd be a nice idea. And then um, I will send out an email later once I check in with Floor about having a subgroup of interested people come together. Thank you. I found my mute button. Uh, any other thoughts, any questions for Diane? Any other thoughts about staff appreciation? Okay, uh, then we'll, we'll move on to uh, the finance committee. Um, and uh, on my uh, delegation tour, I will now delegate to Ursula. I had to find my mute button. I'm going to turn it over to Susan. She, Susan, are you here? She usually goes through the monthly reflections. Suzanne is here. It does look like she's ignoring me. I got it. <laughs> I'm, I'm finding my mute, my unmute button. That's what I was doing. <laughs> Um, well, usually Floor asks if anybody has questions about the informational reports. And so the first informational report was the monthly reflections. And if anyone has questions, if you'd like me to go over it, I certainly can. But um, generally in the interest of time at this meeting, we I take questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Does anybody, oh, I see Lindy's hand. I'm just curious about Matt's position. I think I read it carefully, but have you hired or is there a plan to replace? There is a plan. Uh, we wanted to do it really thoughtfully and take a look at all the job descriptions in the central office and make sure that roles and responsibilities are distributed uh, well. And um, anytime someone leaves, it's a really good idea to do that because sometimes um, due to people's skills, uh, they might accommodate certain things and you wanna make sure that uh, that that position hasn't become over um, filled with duties or less filled with duties. So we've been working on that uh, and hopefully we'll have the position advertised, um, I'm hoping next week, so. Diane? Uh, yeah, so I, Propane and fuel is an obvious overage. I'm not surprised that we didn't budget properly for that. Um, are there any other kind of big ticket items that we're anticipating may also push us over? Um, nothing specific has come up yet. Uh, I'm working on personnel projections, uh, basically as we speak, uh, as new hires come in and trying to figure out, okay, the, the new salaries and the new health insurance and where that will all sugar off. So hopefully uh, by the September board meeting, we'll know best how the, all of the personnel projections have come out. Then I had another, um, another question popped into my head. 
are we, is there any active work being done to gather um, the impact? So this year, again, we have the free meals uh, money provided. Um, and is there data being maintained and kept that would help in the budgeting process for us to consider um, what might happen next year and how do we put in for full coverage again? Do we put in for partial? Do we have the data to, to help us know that information? We are gathering a lot of data. We have a lot of data that was there from prior years and it's just a matter of inserting for uh, FY22. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, is on the schedule for the October board meeting. So that it would be at finance committee in September. Um, the, the last few questions that you have, I think are still very undetermined. Um, we have the rates that we've received from the state, so we know that much. Um, but I do think there's still a lot of questions. I don't know if Megan's heard much from her groups, but they're they're pretty silent on on my side. Same, Suzanne. Yep. Yeah. Well, I wonder if some of that silence is also due to we don't know what the bills are going to look like with the increase in. Um, based on inflation you know so we have our numbers but then we know that's going to go and we don't know so it could be that they're kind of quiet until school gets running as well chris yes oh sorry oh wrong chris chris mcveigh sorry chris thank you uh so suzanne have we accepted a bid for the different types of fuel that we are getting for 2022 and 2023 we have yeah in the monthly reflections at the bottom in bold yeah. i've highlighted the ones that we awarded them to okay uh, so propane was irving wood chips was kusano wood pellets is sandry energy and fuel oil is gillespie fuels okay do you do you have a, a sense as to why the wood chips were so much more why the price went up so much more than it did for the wood pellets I don't. Uh, Chris, did you get any information? I I didn't think to ask something like that. So I can probably find out more. Uh, Chris, do you know uh, anything, Chris O'Brien? The, the wood chips, what are you what are you seeing for numbers, it's, Chris? And well, I see the let's see, prior year. I it thought was, I, I was looking at prior year for the wood chips at 73, oh, 74,000, say, and then projected cost for this year of 124,000 versus the wood pellets, prior year was about 11.5, 11, and projected for this year was 13,000, slightly under 14. So it seems like a dramatically different price increase for wood chips, if I'm reading that correctly. I, I believe the wood chips per ton were only a couple dollars. I went, they, they went from like 66 uh, a ton to 69. So I'd have to I would have to look at the numbers that you have there. We use considerably more tonnage on the the wood chips than we do the pellets. There's 1,800 tons versus 55 tons. Right. So when you're looking at the total dollars, that's going to impact that. I was just thinking proportion wise um, to to the increase. And and the, the other question I have is I um are we going to bid in uh, in November for next year? Is that what that last paragraph means? That is what that last paragraph means is that I would like to bid in November. Um, the research that I've done this summer indicates that if you purchase in November, uh, you you receive a discount for that early purchasing. So it's like a six months future buy. Uh, and you're, you're actually getting what they anticipate the prices for the spring will be, but you're getting a discount on top of that for doing it early. So, and so bidding that way, does that require us to actually pay in advance? No. We're just committing to. Right, yep. You're locking in your contract rates for next fiscal year. Okay, great, thank you. Are there any other questions on the monthly reflections? Hi. Jonas. Uh, not really a question, but just a comment on page 10 of the packet, those last two paragraphs and other factors 
Uh, Suzanne, I really appreciated uh, the way that this memo explains that even though uh, more money went into the fund balance, right, and we spent less money, that that's not necessarily a good thing, right, that there's a human and instructional cost to that. I thought that that was very well said and important to, uh, uh, to keep in mind. We have a budget for a reason, right? And if we can't spend that money, that's not great. Chris McVeigh, do you still have a hand up? I do, and I have another question if if I'm not out of turn. You're not out of turn. I'd, are you on that quarterly finance update at this point, which Jonas jumped us to? The second uh, report that Susan put in, or do you want to go back to the first one? No, I was going to, well, it was more of a, a, um, a funding question, whether or not there, we are expecting any additional COVID funds um, or whether the grants that we have or the grants that we have. Uh, right now, the grants that we have are the grants that we have, although we just put in for a an ESSER cybersecurity grant uh, okay. to help with our cybersecurity plan. Um, so if we can approve for that, I think that was a $30,000 grant up to $30,000. Um, and we are paying attention every time something comes out. We haven't spent all of our ARP ESSER funds and we haven't allocated all of our ARP ESSER funds either. Uh, currently, we're in the process of developing the um, the AHU, sorry, the ERU ventilation project and mechanical project that we want to put into the ARBESER grant. Uh, and so the um, engineers are working on those plans before we submit to the AOE the request for the grant. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions on maybe the finance update, the quarterly finance update? Just to be clear, Ursula, is it for the first piece of it or is it for any of the financial? Uh, I'm going to go with schedule? you can do any of the financial reports up to and including the capital improvement project updates. Up to and so, including. Okay, great. I had a question about the capital improvements. Um, there was an allusion to possible grant funding for the boiler uh, replacements. Um, I was curious uh, what, what that possible grant source was. And also given that that possibility seems to have shifted um, or, or resulted in a proposal to amend the uh, capital improvement plan. And I uh, was curious, since the boilers timeline were moved up, timelines were moved up on that capital improvement plan. Was there anything shifted out of um, the coming fiscal year to make space? And because the next item that we're going to do is an action item exactly on those boilers. Are you willing to hold your questions? And we'll see if anybody has any other capital improvement update questions. Sure. Seeing none, we'll move into the boiler. Um, projects. Chris, you want to give us a quick overview? Sure. Um, let me just pop this up here. <clears throat> so under the recommendations received from Jeff Ford, who is our energy consultant, uh, Bill Ford and I met with district maintenance staff, uh, Jeff Ford and representatives from Messersmith Manufacturing at the Calus East Montpelier and U32 schools to discuss whether uh, we needed to upgrade or replace our current wood chip boiler systems. Um, it was determined that we can do upgrades at East Montpelier in U32, and it was recommended that we replace the Callus boiler system. The upgrades to East Montpelier in U32 will increase efficiency and extend the life of those boilers. Um, there is an opportunity to take advantage of possible grant funding, uh, which Daniel was just alluding to, uh, from the state and federal government, uh, Forest and Parks and Efficiency Vermont were the two resources. Um, if we complete the work to upgrade the boilers at East Montpelier and U32 prior to the end of 2023, um, it remains uncertain whether the full replacement at Callis could meet that deadline. Uh, we need to, you know, um, get a, a scope and budget in place to look at the timelines there. So Daniel, to answer one of your questions, we aren't shifting anything out to shift these in. And the reason for that is 
um, we believe the U32 and East Montpelier upgrades can be done in the spring after the heating season next year. So it wouldn't interfere with projects being done in 2023, the summer of 23. So we think they can be done um, in a timely way so that it won't impact school and it won't impact the projects that we need to do in the summer. Yeah, they're, they're saying it's um, probably about a, a two to three week process to do those upgrades. We were thinking maybe we could do those in April. Chris McVeigh, is that a new hand? Uh, it is. Um, and what is um, what, what would be the benefit of this um, grant to us in terms of what, what, what would it help us with? And also, what um, is concerned about the Callus project not being able to meet the deadline of being done by the end of 2023? So the 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 second question with Callus is uh, that's going to be a more much more invasive project, and we're not sure um, timing wise if we can get everything in place to be able to get that before the funding deadline of July end of July of twenty three. That 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 one's going to require a lot more planning and work. Uh, the upgrades, um, not so much. That that that's going to be a lot quicker process. Um, but to answer your first question, the upgrades, uh, they're, they're talking about adding cyclones um, to those boilers, which would keep um, harmful, harmful particulates to uh, getting out in the atmosphere. Um, new control systems, which will increase the efficiency of how the boilers are fed. Um, new new uh, feed controls, so conveyors and, and um, oxygen sensors there's a there's a bunch of pieces and parts that will improve the efficiency and um and be better for the environment and also prolong the life of those two boilers those two boilers are in actually for the for how old they are in really good shape they've been maintained very well um the callus boiler is just the oldest one in the state they just they did not recommend upgrading that they wanted to they just said it needed to be replaced um, Chris, do you think it's worth the effort to try and get the callus done in terms of this grant funding um, in time, or do you think it would just be too much? I, I think, um, I guess, depending on how soon we could get a, a scope and budget, and then what that what that work's going to entail. Um, if it if it requires infrastructure, um, making the boiler room larger. Mm -hmm. um new new circulation pumps stuff like that uh, just requires a lot more planning and a lot more work so um, we can certainly have a discussion around that to see um what their feeling is on that but it, it's probably going to be pretty be cutting it pretty close okay thank you very much daniel chris do all three uh schools have backup heating systems yeah, those three do. Um, they all have oil backup. So um, East Montpelier, um, U32, and Callus all have oil backup systems. And you know, we had a Jeff Forward did some math for us, and um, you know, we saved eighty five thousand dollars last year alone at U32 by burning wood chips versus oil at the two dollars and forty one cents. I think that we were locked in at last year. So it, it it is significant. Um, we it really don't like to run, prices. But, <laughs> but but those but those wood chip boilers in the shoulder seasons um, get inefficient, right? So once you get up into the 40, 45 degree temps, um, that's when the oil will kick in because they they just don't um, they don't run as efficient. So there's there's a little timing in there as to what, when to shut those down and get the oil boilers running. So we can't my, just rely on those solely. Thanks. My other question related to the grant, so it's sort of a two-part. The, the grants, is there a timeline, which is the reason we're moving these projects up? And the other question is, are all three projects going to be eligible, uh, even if Callus takes this longer projected time that you're expecting? 
yeah the the reason we really were looking at pushing these forward um was because of the grant money that's available um it was pretty significant it was i, I believe if i um, it's it's been a bit now, but looking back at it, uh, Forest and Parks and Efficiency Vermont, I believe, was over a hundred thousand um, dollars for for all three projects. There was a certain amount allocated to each project, um, and that's that's the the thought around Calus. Could we could we get our all of our ducks in a row before that July twenty twenty three deadline, and able to be able to meet that? So. Jeff, Jeff Ford was saying that, that that grant money will not be there next year. So that's kind of what um, pushed this forward. I would add that the fuel prices are another really good reason to <laughs> yeah. keep, because if any of either of those boilers go down, we're, we're relying on oil. Right. Um, and two of them, the East Montpelier and the Callis boilers are both very, uh high in age so right and and we would we would be looking at a pellet system at callus because they don't make a wood chip boiler for that size of school anymore so we would not be able to continue to to burn wood chips there so maggie uh, did i see your hand up question just answered i just wanted information on the type of fuel system that was being contemplated it, it would be similar to what we have at rumney um maybe not the same system they, they you know even in a, a handful of years the technology's gotten better and better on those wood pellet boilers too so um, we'll have to see what they recommend but it would be similar to that it would have a you know a big silo outside with a delivery system to the boiler um but they yeah they just don't they just don't make a, a small enough wood chip boiler anymore unfortunately for that size building because the wood the wood chips are definitely um more affordable right they're 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 cheaper so than than wood pellets because of what it takes to process the pellets so at this time i would like to call for a motion and since I was leading the discussion, I don't know if I can make the motion. Uh, so I will, Ursa, I'd be happy to make these these three motions. I think we need three three different motions. Yes. Uh, so I would move to authorize uh, moving two hundred fifty thousand dollars from the fiscal twenty four twenty five boiler replacement uh, project at Callis Elementary to fiscal twenty two twenty three, and authorize the use of capital reserve funds to develop the scope and budget and proceed with the design development and bid documents for the project. Second. Thank you, Eric. Uh, all those in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 All, those all those opposed say nay. That motion has carried unanimously. Um, I also move uh, that the board authorize moving $250,000 from the fiscal 24-25 boiler replacement project at East Montpelier Elementary to fiscal 22-23 for the boiler upgrades at East Montpelier and U32. Second. Thank you, Eric. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. That motion carries. I also uh, move that the board authorize the superintendent to sign contracts with Messer Smith Manufacturing for the boiler system upgrades at East Montpelier and U32 not to exceed a total of $250,000 contingent upon the state providing a bid waiver due to a sole source for a sole source for proprietary equipment. I'll second it. Lindy, all those in favor. Oh, great. I have a question. Jonas, Jonas have a yes, question. Yes, yes, Chris. Um, that that uh, motion does not include callus. Was that purposeful? Yes. Okay. And why? Because we don't know the scope and budget for callus yet. We have a scope and budget for um, the upgrades at East Montpelier and U32. Okay. Yeah, that's this what the Go ahead. Does, does this prevent us from coming back later 
if it turns out that we can get Callus done by July 1st of 2023. No, no, and that's our intention to come back. Um, once we have a scope and budget for Callus, we'll do Callus as a separate approval dollar amount. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yep. And that could likely be a different manufacturer too, Chris. Oh, it could be, okay, thanks, Chris. Are we ready for the question? Okay, uh, all those in favor of the motion, uh, please say aye. 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 All, those, all those opposed, please say nay. That motion carries. Moving on to the policy committee. You know, Chris, uh, can I ask one, one more general question about of course. the finance? Um, yeah. So, so Suzanne, I see uh, oftentimes that at the, um, when you're giving giving us the information about where our um, finances are, you, you use the two percent recommended um, allocation for the um, uh, for the uh, fund balance. Fund balance, and um, you know you you always indicate how much over that two percent we are. Um, I'm gonna say I, I get nervous if it's two percent. I think because it's like 122,000 or something along those lines for our entire system. So is there? Um, I mean, are we driving toward getting to the two percent, or is that just an informational piece of uh, just informational for us? You know, I, I love that you're asking this question because the finance committee uh, started at their last meeting talking about um, some budget planning uh, and developing a, a budget plan and in, involved in that budget plan development will be discussing what the board feels is the right fund balance target. Um, I've used 2% because that was what my predecessor used. And so mm -hmm. I've just continued with that uh, without a full on conversation with the whole board. There are many recommendations uh, from different angles. You might look at enough to cover three months of your expenses. Um, sometimes I've heard 5% thrown out there. GFOA uh, has a couple different models that you can follow. And so the finance committee is uh, working on that kind of discussion and starting it and hopefully we'll be bringing um, a proposed plan to the board in the next few months. Thank you. Very much. Any other questions or thoughts uh, for the finance committee and for Suzanne? Well then Chris, I'm prepared to turn it right back over to you for the policy committee. Great, right, thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, and we had our first policy committee meeting of this year on the 8th of August, uh, welcoming uh, Megan Murray, who is a uh, uh, a delightful um, addition along with uh, Kat Fair, who also joined us and just was a really nice contribution to the, to the discussion. Uh, one of the things we talked about was uh, how to set up a mechanism for a more uh, uniform and routine review of policies for updating. And I am meeting with uh, Megan and Michelle tomorrow to set up a, a proposed structure for doing that. Uh, we also talked um, at the meeting about uh, school choice, uh, and we'll be bringing a, um, a discussion points to the board to talk about school choice because it's, it's a big issue, uh, and it really touches on more than just picking which school someone can go to, uh, which a student can go to, uh, but it has, it has a potential ripple effect that we'd like to hear the board's impact uh, input on. Uh, before setting out uh, any type of community engagement on the issue of school choice. Uh, but with that, we have uh, three policies, I think three policies up for discussion tonight. The first is um, B1, substitute teacher policy, and it's for first reading uh, with the expectation that it will be adopted at our uh, September 21st meeting. Um, does anyone, and, and um, Included in the packet are uh, two copies of, of B1. The first one just shows the edits that were made and that are incorporated in B2. Any questions on B1? 
Maggie, Maggie. Question. Okay, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see hands, so just feel free Press to. Maggie. Yeah, yeah, I, I um, wanted to ask if the statement um, graduated from high school is inclusive of the general equivalency diploma, and if that needs to be clearly stated. Um, that's a, that's a great question. We didn't. If it does that did not come up. It did not come up in our discussion. Um, and what did come up in this discussion is why uh, the policy was being amended and it was uh, being amended uh, somewhat as a reflection of the difficulty that we're having in terms of personnel. Uh, and so, um, so you know, th that's a, a great question, Maggie. And I think, um, you know, I would think it would, but I'd like to hear from the board as to whether or not um, we want to include that it does include, like, um, you're talking about like a GED, Maggie? Yeah, and I, technically that that fits the criteria. I'm just questioning whether it would be beneficial to have that explicitly included when in, the, in the statement graduate from high school. I tend to think it would. Gra high school graduation, because it's, you know. I tend to think it would because it would be it, you know, just be informative to anyone who's looking at the policy. But I, I would like to hear from others as well on the policy committee and otherwise. So Maggie, are you, suggest, are you suggesting that we add another statement there that just says graduated from oh. high school or equivalent? We're more specifically um, saying, or, or has I'm, I'm not exactly sure how how I would well I mean it's still a diploma it's just the way that this is worded doesn't to me makes me question whether it's inclusive or not I'm not I'm not exactly sure how I would change the wording um well I think we'd maybe change it to say um uh, for a person who has a high school diploma or its equivalent. I think that covered it. Um, yeah, I would I would endorse that. Um, I'd also like to hear a little bit more about the conversation that the committee had about removing that language and who you heard from and and you know what the what the atmospherics were around that. So I don't know. Go ahead. Sorry, Chris. I was going to say some of, the, some of the conversations were about, um, for instance, prior to that, it had said uh, uh, grad or degree, college degree or whatever. I don't remember what the specific language is, but people were talking about, uh, you know, college kids who come home who don't have college degrees yet, who come and sub and do a really phenomenal job with um, kids. And I, I think that, you know, part of the, I just looked at a document about the staffing shortage in Vermont schools. Um, you know, so I think there's like two pronged piece here. One is let's try and get more people who can support the system. And the other was around, are we really being discriminatory in uh, sort of setting that bar so high that people who are qualified aren't able to participate and provide services for the schools? I mean, the language does say preferred, right? It, it's not a requirement. Um, that's, that's not to say that I, I, I don't think that this is a good edit. So the discussion done also included that uh, uh, decision making would also try and have the preference of what we, you know, the best qualified person. Uh, and so it, even though it's not mm -hmm. saying preferred, um, my understanding is that the administrators would be looking for the, the best qualified person among the pool. Uh, there's also discussion about whether to add a sunset provision because we're looking at this as not an emergency policy, but a policy that is being modified in the midst of a significant personnel shortage uh, and whether or not to revisit um, this language in a couple of years to see if the, the um, environment had changed. Um, but we didn't, we didn't put in sunset provision, but we're, we're aware that it's a modification to encourage um, a broader pool of, of potential employees. That, that still meet what we need in terms of qualified people. 
to substitute in our schools. Lindy? Uh, I've, in the districts I've worked in, we've had college students who came in and subbed and they did an excellent job. And something that Dennis said that just made me think about it, we might have somebody who's in college, not even thinking about being a teacher, but substitutes and then says, hey, this one really worked for me and I think I will go into teaching. So it removes some limits. And since these people get vetted through the central office and the principals have the option of putting them on the list or not putting them on the list, I think it gives more leeway to just have the person has a high school diploma or it's equivalent. Thanks, Wendy. Daniel? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna agree and and emphasize rather than explicitly mentioning GED, because I, I think another population that that might be um, worth considering is those with international educations and some secondary mm -hmm. school graduation equivalent that um, might not fall into our American definitions. Mm. Mm -hmm. So Daniel, was your proposal to um, just use an equivalency language as opposed to GED? So it's not off-putting. Yes? Yes. Okay, great. Yep, Daniel's nodding. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? on this particular policy? It's raining up. The Wi-Fi for a lot of us is just really going down the tubes. Sorry, what's going down the tubes, Maggie? The Wi-Fi. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so the... <laughs> Internet. <laughs> so um, on B1, uh, my understanding is that we're going to modify the language uh, under the qualifications uh, to um, say that uh, it's a person who has a high school diploma or its equivalent. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And so with that um, um, modification, any other proposed changes to this B1, policy B1? So we'll put it over for a second reading in on uh, September 21st and adoption at that time. Okay, thank you. So now up next is um, C8, which is for second reading and adoption. And it's the pupil privacy rights policy. Does anyone have any questions about this policy? Okay, hearing none. Um, uh, Jonas, do you want to hold them all for a vote at the end as a slate, or do you want to go individually? I think we've done individually in the past, but let's let's go through the comments and then we'll 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 take action on on each on all three of them one one at a time. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, next up is a policy C one on uh, education records. Is there any comment? Um, on this particular policy. Jonas, you see any hands? I don't see any. I do not, no. nope. Okay, thank you. This, and our final policy for uh, tonight is the C14, um, Section 504 and ADA Grievance Protocol for Students and Staff. Um, and this is a policy that we went back and forth on a couple of times uh, with the primary focus um, on getting the appeal process right and making sure it did what we wanted it to do. Um, and that is the reason for some of the bolding, I believe, to make clear um, what the appeal um, process involves and where it can be made and by whom. Um, so does anyone have any questions about any of the language um, of this policy? 
can you tell us what you went around and around about? Well, you know, we, we were trying to make it clear that uh, someone did not need to, a complainant did not need to use this, um, this policy in order to appeal. They could go directly to the um, it, U.S. Department of, of Education for the Office of Civil Rights, uh, and that um, that th this was not the only method of appeal. We're just trying to make that crystal clear. Any other any questions for Chris about um, about C fourteen, Maggie? It is. This final policy is new, no existing policy on grievance for 504s. Um, it's a I, yeah, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I think it is new um, because I don't think we have a, a previous policy like that, but I could be wrong. I think we took it up from the VBA, VS, VSP. Okay. Any other comments, questions for Chris and the committee? Daniel, you're muted. You're still muted. That will help. Um, I had a question about the policies as a group. In terms of annotation, how they're written, uh, some provide sort of a table of legal references at the bottom. Um, at least one has sort of footnoted legal references. And I'm wondering if we have a problem with sort of that sort of different, different style of writing and annotation, um, the inconsistency that it might present in our policies, not volunteering to reconcile them myself though. Um. So we are uh, largely getting our policies, model policies from the Vermont School Board Association uh, and the legal citation and vetting process, I believe is helpful to support what the different uh, points of the policy can be. It also ensures that what's mandatory to be in a policy is in the policy and it provides um, a, a site for individuals who are looking at the policy to go find what the site is. Um, so I think to the extent that th the citations are basically roadmaps to this is what it says and the site is this is why it says it. And, um, and that is current presumably as of now, is there support from School Board Association for future law changes and and our ability to sort of update our legal references, I guess, is it is an important um, secondary question. Uh, there is, and they revise and review their policies with the changes in the law, and at least in Vermont, those changes usually usually occur July first. Uh, from if there's a, a statutory change, usually takes place on the July first the year after the law has been passed through and signed into law is an effective, it becomes effective July 1st. Got it. Yeah, I think, I think they're both usable forms. So I, yeah. I'm okay with that. I wanted to raise that as a point. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Any further discussion of these policies that are up for a second reading and up for approval before we uh, take action? Hearing none, uh, can someone uh, make a motion for uh, policy C1? I move that we adopt policy C1 as presented. Thank you, Ursula. Well, second. Oh, sorry, conversation. Thank you, Dennis. Any further discussion? Bring on all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. 
that policy is adopted. Um, can I get a motion uh, for policy C8, please? Does anyone I move want to we adopt we adopt C8 uh, pupil privacy rights policy as presented? Second. Can I get a, thank you, Ursula. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Thank you. That policy is adopted. Can someone make a motion for policy C14? I move that we adopt policy C14 as presented. You, Ursula? Second. Thank you, Diane. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. That policy is adopted. And we're moving right along to the consent agenda. Would anybody like to move to approve the minutes of June 15th, June 22nd, and June 23rd? I move to accept the minutes of, now I have to remember, June 15th, looking for the next one, um, June 22nd, and June 23rd. Second. Ursula, any discussion of those minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving those minutes, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Those minutes are approved. And for the board orders, Lindy. I ask you to move for, to accept the board orders. Okay, the board orders or the personnel? Is it board orders first? Okay. Um, all right, let me get them in the right order. So I make a motion to accept the board order for June 16th through June 2022 in the amount of... $11,287,461.80. Can we get a second? Second. Thank you, Ursula. Any discussion of the board of those board orders ending uh, June 30th? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Those board orders are approved. Lindy, can you lead us through the board orders ending July 20th? Yes. I make a motion to accept the board order dated 7 1 through 7 20 22 in the amount of $427,612.36. And a second? A second. Thank you, Chris. Any discussion of those set to board that set of board orders? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Hearing none, uh, those board orders are approved. And Lindy, can you lead us through the last set through August 17th? I make a motion to accept the board order dated. 72122 through 81722 in the amount of $986,657.75. In a second. second. Thank you, Ursula. Any discussion of these board orders? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Those board orders are approved and rolling on into personnel on page 42. Uh, would anyone like to move uh, to accept the new teacher nominations? I think I've got that email too. 
Um, <laughs> Uh, I make a motion to accept the new teacher nominations for the 22-23 school year as follows. Uriah Proctor Mattingly for Callis School-Wide Support. Christiana Uzinsa, a U32 music teacher. Olga Benoit, U32 math interventionist. Honeybee Barrett, Dodi 5-6 classroom teacher. Mary Ellen Monday, Romney mm. School Wide Support. And a second. Second. Thank you, Chris. Any discussion of the new teacher nominations? I will note that uh, two of the, uh, the folks listed here um, appear to have no connection to Vermont at all. Okay which it hopefully is an indication that recruiting that sort of widespread, you know, wide net recruiting is paying off. We need more Vermonters. It's great to see this. All those in favor of accepting the new teacher nominations, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Hearing none, the new teacher nominations are uh, approved. Um, There's can a someone more. move to accept yep, the long-term substitutes? I make a motion to accept the long-term substitute for 22-23 school year of Maxwell Sagala, U32 Social Studies. Second. A second. Thank you, Ursula. Any discussion of the long-term substitute? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. That is approved. And Lindy, the change in position, if you wouldn't mind. Yep. I make a motion to approve the change in position from Mac Margaret Dawkins, a speech language pathologist. In a second. Second. Thank you, Ursula. Any discussion of this change in position? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All, all those opposed, please say nay. That is approved. Um, Megan, can you give us an update on vacancies? Sure. Um, I would start by saying it's um, there's been a lot of activity and work around hiring just in this past few weeks. Um, as we welcome new staff tomorrow, we are, uh, as of you know, 5:55 p.m. are adding names to. Um, make sure that we count people because that's how close to the wire we are hiring. Um, that is good news. Um, we've made pretty steady progress on many of our vacancies. There are still several and um, our vacancies are centered around uh, interventionists and special educators or special education service providers. Um, I will say that um, U32, um, which had a, a large number of vacancies in special ed, um, has been able to fill those vacancies with um, professionals who, um, by looking very closely at what types of services we need delivered and focusing on service delivery, um, have managed to fill positions, um, which is good news. It does mean some restructuring around um, case management and, and something specific to the special ed process, um, but they are uh, in, a, in a much better place than they were earlier. Um, the vacancies currently um, that are probably taking most of our attention in special ed are speech language pathologists. Um, we do continue to have vacancies at the elementary level. Um, this is prompting a couple of things. One of the things it's prompting is conversations about um, potential need to contract with service providers on a short-term basis to be able to provide the required services. Um, we have had conversations with the association about this um, and we'll continue to have the positions open and posted and interview um, to be able to fill them, but we do need to be able to serve students as required by their IEPs. Um, uh, and we, we continue to have a number of um, support staff vacancies, uh, paraeducators, um, although we are filling them all the time and I have two emails in my inbox from Carla with two more people that we were able to bring on board. So um, given the picture of vacancies in the state, 
Um, I wouldn't say we're in a wonderful shape, but we're in better shape than some of our neighbors. Um, but we are continuing to work on some of these intervention positions. Happy to answer questions. Maggie. Yep, go is ahead. Telehealth Maggie. being considered, are telehealth services being considered for the SLP positions? They are. That's one of the models we're looking at for contracted staff. Um, that would require some looking at which students can access their services that way and which can't. Um, it's not a universal, it's not a method that works for all kids, but it could work for some. So it's part of the conversation. Second piece is, could you briefly speak to how the implementation of the new um, special education law um, allows for other providers, not just special educators to be providing that service? I think that would be helpful, just a quick review for the board. Yeah, thanks, Maggie. Um, so Act 173, which went into effect July 1st, and as you are, are aware, changes the funding of special education. It also gives flexibility in how we can provide services. Um, previously, um, for a service to be delivered, it had to be delivered by a special educator, so a teacher with a special ed license. Um, and the easiest example of where that would be challenging is someone who is a literacy interventionist. So a professional letter, professional level expert in literacy was not able to provide special ed services under our previous model. And now they are, um, which is part of how we're able to um, provide services in U32 with that different model. Um, so you're right, Maggie, our ability to be flexible is much greater now than it was prior to July 1. Uh, Megan, this may have been covered in a meeting back in June that I, that I don't remember, um, but do we have a driver's ed teacher? We do. Great, thank you. Yes, exciting. Any other questions uh, for Megan uh, about uh, vacancies? Okay, quick meeting tonight. Um, future agenda items, diversifying the educator workforce and hiring. Um, and uh, uh, suggestions that we make, uh, may want to make to the VSBA uh, for their uh, annual resolutions process. Uh, and we'll take that up um, at future meetings. Uh, board reflection. So Jonas, I wanna thank you for stepping in and, and uh, guiding the meeting tonight. Um, you really, you felt, I felt more comfortable as we've gone on and at the end, I thought we were, we were a late night Boston radio host or an auction, um, but <laughs> you did a nice job. It was really nice to see you well, step thank up. thank you, Chris. So, I mean, the, the, the nice thing is that from policy down through personnel, it was all motions. Right, you get, getting that rhythm right, you get the gavel, yeah, you, and it's, you, yeah, you. you are. But thank you very much. My pleasure. Do we do we have to have public comments now? We I do. Mean, ask. We do. Uh, I, I would. Thank you, guys. Um, I would ask for uh, uh, any members of the public that are here that want to comment. Uh, now is the time before we adjourn. David. Howdy, uh, just a quick comment. I had problems getting on today because I understand your policy is to try to avoid um, you know, the incident where you had some people Zoom bombing last year. Um, and I won't go into the semantics of what exactly it means to have a full name, but the process just doesn't work, unfortunately. Like in um, my case, I had to join from another computer because on the one that I preferred to join from, um, I can't actually change my name until I join. And there was a request in the meeting uh, room, uh, the, the waiting room that is to, um, you know, state my name and I happily would have, but there's, I don't know if this is a setting you can enable on Zoom, but there was absolutely no way to reply to that message. And so I tried calling in on my phone, hoping that I could join that way and um, be able to say, hey, look, it's me. I'm going to get in and change my name. And unfortunately, in that particular case, there was a 
if not for the fact that I was already joined on Zoom, I would never have heard the message asking for me to state my name because it was sent to meeting room chat. But if you're only joining by phone, there's no way for you to see that. So there are some uh, technical issues with trying to implement the policy that really need to be sorted out. Sorry about that, David. Um, Mark, I'm hoping that there's something that we can do, do to look at that and, and resolve that difficulty that David and others may have had. Thank you, David. Well received. Uh, any other public comments? Hearing, seeing none, uh, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, everyone. It's my pleasure. Good night. Be well. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you all for a great start to the year. Thanks, Jonas. See you, Dan. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks guys.